All right, welcome. Welcome. I just wanted to say look, welcome to the end of democracy. <laughs> we are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will, we, we will endeavor to, forget, oh, oh, oh. to get rid of it and replace it with, with this right here. We'll replace it with this right, right. here. Amen. Yeah. Jack Posobiec talking about the end of democracy with his buddy Steve Bannon laughing and yelling amen. And that video got a lot of plays. You probably saw it already because it's so startling. But trust me, trust me on this. That was just the start of Jack Posobiec's crazy weekend. Uh, here's a pretty long clip of excerpts from his speech they actually gave at the formal CPAC event this past week. Watch this, listen carefully, and picture it in German. Right up there. They are the ones that are seeking to destroy not our democracy, but our constitutional republic. And is it incumbent upon us to restore it? We've watched as our schools have turned into incubators of hatred, hatreds of Christians, hatred of straight people, of white people, of successful people, hatred for our forefathers, hatred of our history, hatred for those who founded from nothing, the greatest country in the history of the world, the United States of America. Lock up the criminals, liquidate the, the administrative state. Are you prepared to fight? Are you prepared to take their best shot and say, is that all you got? They say Alexander gathered his Macedonians before the march on Persia. Well, I say, I see before me a gathering of Magadonians here in this room. And after, after we raise that swamp to the ground, we will establish the new American Republic on its ashes, and our first order of business will be righteous retribution for those who betrayed America. They will be judged. Yeah. I mean, apocalyptic, insane stuff. And I can't imagine how proud he was of that. I mean, can you imagine how long he worked the Magdalonians? <laughs> I mean, I mean, what a ridiculous, I mean, the, the, you want to mock it? But when you actually listen to the words and the deeply authoritarian and frankly fascist nature of what he's proposing, retribution, attacks, trying people. And then let's throw this, let's throw this screenshot up of Trump's truth social post that just came out recently. I'm going to read this. 2024 is our final battle. This is Donald Trump. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalist. We will cast out the communist, Marxist, and fascist. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will roll out, route, excuse me, route the fake news media. We'll drain the swamp and we will liberate our country from these tyrants and villains once and for all. Holy shit, is that some fascist stuff or what? <laughs> That's Donald J. Trump, former president of the United States. That's a post he posted. Now, we didn't think he, you don't really think he wrote that because there's no fake all caps and stuff. But that is literally what they're talking about, this Republicans. And, you know, NBC and other reporters were there at CPAC and said, hey, there's, there was no shit beyond the Nazi words. There was no shit Nazis in the crowd mingling and welcomed at the event. And CPAC came out as they do attacking the media, saying it's an outright lie. And then the producer of NBC posted this brief clip. Yeah, a Nazi salute. <laughs> Those guys participating in that video were some of the guys that went to unite the right. They are no shit Nazis. Hanging out in the lobby and having badges for CPAC. That's where we are at now. This was the conservative organization. Used to be fairly, not this crazy, but they've always been a little crazy. Welcoming neo-Nazis, welcoming fascist speak, echoing the authoritarians of the past. So I thought no better time than have a historian come join us who studied authoritarians of the past than Kevin Cruz. So let's just get on with the show. Oh 
Oh, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Once again, I am Fred Wellman, your host of On Tomorrow's FU Wellman. You're still in the right place. It's been like 30 seconds. Glad you didn't leave. Yep, it's been a crazy week, as, as always. Um, just CPAC was nuts. Uh, you know, Trump is nuts. Everybody's nuts. And I want to do what I love doing, which is bringing back guests that haven't been on the show since we joined the Myers Touch Network. So Kevin Cruz, Dr. Kevin Cruz, professor of history at Princeton University, specialized in political, social, urban, suburban history. Your bio is long. <laughs> With a particular right. interest yeah. in conflicts over race, rights, religion, the making of modern conservatism, which is why you're here. Kevin, welcome back to the show and the Midas Touch Network. Great to be here. So they had Nazis at CPAC. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, as a professor of history and race and religion and conservatism, what's your take on all that? I mean, it's insanity, right? I mean, they denied it, but then there's video. It's crazy. I mean, and you know, the, the story of modern conservatism had long been one of we kicked out the far right, right, right. We don't want, we don't want to have anything to do with those crazies. My my first book was called uh, White Flight. Yep, uh, and uh, uh, it starts off with you know literal neo Nazis marching in the streets of Atlanta, and they get pushed aside. They're too radical. The Klan is a better option for segregation. It's more respectable wow. in the South. And, and and so I tell this story about you know how the the Nazis get pushed aside. They go for a much more respectable, much more, uh, you know, presentable form of modern conservatism. And that's the story nationwide. You know, in the 60s, there was a big moment when William F. Buckley kicked the crazies out of the conservative movement, said, yeah. we don't want to have anything to do with these Nazis, with the, the John Birch Society, these people who thought, you know, Dwight Eisenhower uh, was a communist agent, <laughs> things like that. Yep. And now they're back. Yeah, uh, the John Birch Society is a sponsor, an official sponsor of CPAC, I believe, right now. The Nazis showed up in full force and were mingling, giving you know their little salutes yep. uh, to the crowd, and it's all apparently you know well and good now. Yeah, uh, and again, that story that uh, you know uh, Buckley had kicked the Nazis out, you know, that was actually largely overblown. We've got historians who've uh, shown that that was a uh, um, uh, kind of a fiction. But at least it was a fiction they tried to embrace, right? We've got to be respectable. We can't be associated with Nazis and with these fringe far-right kooks. We are better than that. Well, CPAC is now saying we're not better than that. That's who we are. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in the clip I showed, you got Steve Bannon laughing along with Jack Posobiec about overthrowing the government, you know, putting the cross first. Then he gives this apocalyptic speech about, you know, retribution. I, I show a picture off in the show. We should probably throw it up later, Matt, of of when I went to I went to a, a festival here in my hometown where I grew up, uh, the little fall festival they have. And the Republican Party of Missouri was there and they had this picture of the Trump, Donald Trump mugshot with the words retribution written across the front of it. And it was shocking to me at the time. I actually wrote a Substack about. It. I was like, I mean, that this is sort of the 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 not just a, a fringe anymore. This is the party at this point. Yeah, it's, again, it's become a cult of personality about Trump, and he has made it clear that he wants to seek retribution in their words uh, against all the people that have done him personally wrong, yeah. uh, which they project to be they've done you wrong, right? You know, he keeps saying, uh, if they come after me, they can come after you. Well, un unless you defraud of the state of New York with business practices or, you know, um, uh, committed sexual abuse against somebody, they're probably not going to come against you in the same way. But There's that. He wants it to be, you know, if they come after me, they come after you. That's his attitude. Yeah, well, as somebody who's being sued for $150 million by Mike Flynn over a single tweet, it you know, maybe he's right. I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's them right. coming after us is the thing, right? right you know, right. And, and, and one of the things that came out this weekend, too, that it, that does tie right into this in the conversation is uh, you saw the Chai Raddick um, uh, uh, conversation. I don't know if you saw Taylor Lorenz interviewed Libs the TikTok yeah. lady. And she just conversationally rolls out what I what struck me is what we're seeing a lot of, this, and, and Elon Musk does it now, is that they just conversationally roll out what is great replacement theory, the, you know, the, the idea that these these dirty foreigners are taking over our country they're all going to be they're all going to vote you know these brown people are going to vote democrat just today on the way here congressman tim burchett was on uh, on fox news with maria bartiromo saying that uh they, they want the, the democrats want these uh, uh, uh mexicans to come in and they give them absentee ballots so they can vote absentee right. there's no way to stop that it, it's just it went from a friend i think frank when i was looking at our notes from our conversation a year ago, Kevin, when Myth America came out, and we talked yeah. about great replacement theory in our conversation then about how weird it was, and a year later, it's the conversation now. Conversation. It's gone mainstream. Again, like Nazis at CPAC, it's gone mainstream. And this is a, we should say, this is an old um, trope in American history. This is something um, that was really popular in the 1920s. Yeah. Advanced by the Klan, advanced by immigration restrictionists then. 
uh, really popular books by people like Madison Grant and Lothrop Stoddard, who wrote openly about, you know, kind of the the, the threat to worldwide white supremacy. Yeah. They were worried about these immigrants coming in. Uh, and there were different kinds of immigrants. This is a, a kind of a perennial story in American history where there's always a panic about an immigrant group, but the immigrant group changes. Yeah. At the founding era, they were worried about my people. They were worried about Germans. And then they were worried about the Irish. And then they were worried about the Chinese. Uh, in the early 20th century, they were worried about Southeastern Europeans, uh, worried about uh, Italians, Greeks, Eastern European Jews. Now the same tropes are applied uh, against people from Mexico and Central America. But the central argument is still the same. The good white people of America are being overrun by these foreign hordes. Yeah. And it's intentional. And they're trying to bring these people here to outbreed us, to outnumber us, to replace us. And this is obviously incredibly racist yeah. and incredibly dangerous. And we saw this not just in the 1920s when the Klan acted upon this with great violence. We see this in our own time. Uh, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting uh, was inspired by the Great Replacement Theory. Yeah. The murders of all those African Americans in Buffalo at the supermarket yep. was inspired by somebody, I believe, who believes in the Great Replacement Theory. Right? El Paso. So this El, is something El, that El, is El Paso fueling yep. Yep. massacres in our own time. And the idea that a broad political movement is just embracing this publicly is really dangerous. But I also should say it's not just dangerous and racist. It's also incredibly stupid. <laughs> this idea that immigrants will immediately be given the vote yeah. goes against everything we know about the long process of naturalization. This thing takes 10 years, 12 years before, Elon Musk has even said this about himself, before you become a citizen and are able to vote. Right. And once you get that vote, they don't all vote Democratic. Nope. In fact, we've seen with with recent uh, um, uh, immigrants from uh, from Mexico and Central America, they're often in favor of closing the border, of building right. the wall. They don't want more people to follow them. There's a grand American tradition of immigrants pulling up the ladder behind them, and yeah. they do that. So there's no guarantee these are going to be Democratic votes. So it is just not just a racist and very dangerous conspiracy theory. We have to point out it is one that is incredibly stupid as yeah. well. Yeah. And, that, and it's not even true. Like we saw that with Lincoln Project during the 2020 campaign. Right. We struggle. Right. Cuban, Cuban Americans, especially right. South Florida. South Florida went for Trump. They, the, there's a lot of theory, you know, the strongman thing. I mean, the, the authority, I mean they, 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 they look up to that machismo. Uh, that's yeah, that's these, part these of Latino culture. America, they're fleeing socialist governments. Right. 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 That's what they're leaving. The idea that they're going to come here and sign up with a squad uh, with AOC or somebody is ridiculous. Right. Right. So. Right. It's just it's just incredibly dumb. It doesn't make it any less dangerous, but I think it's important to also notice it's stupid. But it goes into that that fear mongering that's so thing. You know, you and I did talk too about here in Myth America, and I didn't mention up front because we just went right to talking. But uh, your last book, you edited Myth America. For those who aren't familiar, a book a, a compendium of short stories, short uh, essays written by a number of historians. That you are one of them. Fascinating. But if you haven't seen this book, folks. I pick it up. Uh, it's probably on paperback by now. I, I you, it is, yeah. You, you see, mine's a little tattered, <laughs> you know, because there's some great. There's, it was tabbed. It's still tabs in there. You but, know, and one good. of those talked by Lawrence Glickman talked about white backlash, uh, yeah. and 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 you and I talked this before about how it's turning on. And even a year ago, it was turning on the transgender. Uh, the, the the attack on transgender rights was Dylan Mulvaney, and that was like. But now I, I live in Missouri, where they're all about trying to outlaw. You know, the the, the care they're, they're they're investigating the clinics. It really feels like, in a lot of ways, this white backlash is now turning on the LGBTQ community. Um, the term I hear a lot and from that story was, you know, it's being shoved down their throats too fast. Yeah. You know, it, it's the same as the white backlash. And now we've got Nex Benedict died after being assaulted at, her, at their school. Um, you know, more and more of these efforts are being pushed. I mean, historically speaking, from what the white back, do, how do we fight this? I mean, how have we fought? Yeah. Ha, have we been successful in history? Perhaps not. I mean, how do you, what's your perspective as a historian? Like, yeah. this is all that's old is new again, right? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are, I think, maybe two things to point out here. One is that, that great piece you mentioned by Larry Glickman on White Backlash and Myth America uh, does a good job of noting that we've got to stop talking about it as a backlash, as presenting these people uh, who are who are uh, pressing this agenda. They want to pretend that they're the victims, yeah. right? That's the whole idea of backlash. We didn't start this. Other people started this. You've shoved this down our throat. We're simply responding in kind to what you have done to us. And it denies all agency. It frees them of any responsibility, hmm. right? Uh, and it uh, we don't do that with any other social movement, right? When we talk about you know the civil rights movement or anti-war movements, we talk about 
people with an agenda and they put these ideas in practice and they follow them through. And, and whether you like it or not, you know, they have responsibility. Well, people pushing the white backlash have responsibility for what they're doing too. Yeah. So we've got to first recognize that they're not the innocent victims, that they've got an agenda, they're pressing this. How to respond? I think the big mistake a lot of people make is they treat these things as uh, culture wars issues, uh, as if they're somehow yep. marginal, right? Yep. This isn't about the culture wars. This is about basic freedom. This is about liberty, right? You've got state legislatures that want to make it because of this transgender panic, who want to inspect the genitals of high school children playing sports. Yep. That's not small government, right? <laughs> and this attack they're making against uh, 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 trans folks is just the tip of the spear. Yeah, We've seen this with Dobbs. They came for abortion. They've come in Alabama for in vitro fertilization. Yep. They're coming, I guarantee it, for contraception. We've seen Christopher Rufo say the only purpose of sex should be to have children. Recreational sex is bad. Yep. I mean, I don't want to stop these people as they step on rake after rake, but if you want to come after recreational sex in America, <laughs> I mean, I thought coming after beer and ice cream was stupid, but they're going to come after recreational sex. Have at it. But what the people on the other side need to do is to point out this isn't culture wars. This isn't a fringe thing about transgender athletes. These are, this is a movement that for all its pretensions about being limited government is actively putting the government in every single sphere of life, Yeah. right? Meddling with your kids, following them into the bathroom, following them into the changing room. This is ridiculous, right? Yeah. And it's got to be understood under those terms, that this is an assault on individual liberty. Yeah. And you know, I say it a lot too. Because I live in Missouri, and, and, I, and this is real stuff here. And, and I get a little frustrated sometimes when, and I don't want to be that guy, but those folks in the coast, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the New York press and the DC press, and, and and they say, oh, culture wars. And I say a lot, I'm an old soldier. I'm a veteran of combat. I did four combat tours, right? My belief, if, it's, if war is war, when people are dying or getting killed or injured, right? And this really is. These culture wars, this attack, this assault on transgender health care, Nex Benedict died. Mm -hmm. because they were non-binary and mm -hmm. kids teased them and she got they got beaten sorry they got beaten and died people are dying this is not mm -hmm. a culture war <laughs> this is a real life war and until we take it that seriously i i, I fear for us mm -hmm. exactly right exactly right well it's I, that's I, again i can't recommend the book enough there's like you can just kind of page through and find other pe you know parts of it that matter you know and 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 that's why i talk about quite a bit is is where do we fuck you know one of the other things i, I do miss you being on twitter about <laughs> it ties right into what we're just talking about is your good old days of being up dinesh d'souza <laughs> you know for those who don't know Kevin Hiroki left X is now on threads, but he's not writing much there either because he's writing a book in his office. <laughs> you know, the I'm I, blue I, sky too. Blue sky too. So uh, I do oh, you're on blue social sky. Media. Okay. I got I don't I don't spend enough time on blue sky. I gotta get up there. <laughs> um it's I, I I brought it up. I I put it in here because we I did see somebody talking about the Southern strategy. They still stick to this belief yeah. that the parties didn't switch, right? And and that they did switch at some point. That and we were just leading right into this great replacement theory as being a part these these apocalyptic themes. There was this switch. Why do you think they still cling to the idea? I mean, there's not a day that goes by somebody doesn't tell me. Well, the Democrats support the KKK. <laughs> you know, it's, it's insane. Yeah, I mean, it's it's and again, it's a remarkable change that it's only happened within the last. 15 years. Right. You know, if you look back at the George W. Bush administration, their attitude was to apologize for this. Right. And it was, I think, sincere. Yeah. I think the, the Bush administration really did want to expand the Republican Party beyond a kind of largely white base. They made outreach to uh, Latinos uh, with immigration reform. Uh, a totally different party. Uh, they made inroads with African Americans. People like Colin Powell and Condi Rice were prominent in the in the cabinet. But the leaders of the RNC, both um, uh, Michael Steele, an African-American himself, uh, but before that, Ken Melman, both openly acknowledged the Southern strategy and apologized for it, right? They yeah. said, look, we used to appeal to racists. We don't do that anymore. We're now going to do this. And that was, I think, a smart move and one that was reflected by a new generation of Republicans like Marco Rubio and Nikki Haley and Tim Scott. They could make a case for this, right? That, yep. that we're a younger, we're not your father's Republican Party, right? Well, then Trump came. And pushed back against all those changes, doubled down on the immigration restriction, doubled down on the old white people. And so the move was instead of acknowledging and apologizing 
for this past to pretend none of it ever happened. Yeah. Right. And, and to, and the idea, I've said this in my piece in myth America on, on the Southern strategy, the idea that I would have to write a piece like this at all was just remarkable. Right. Yeah. This was just the most boring conventional wisdom uh, because it was all over the historical record, all over the journalistic accounts, the archival material, the public pronouncements of these politicians. This was all out in the open, right? It's hiding in plain sight. The idea that someone would just deny that any of that ever happened was really remarkable. Uh, but I, so I think they denied it in an effort to pretend that their party is still, quote, the party of Lincoln, right? right? That nothing has ever changed in, in history since then. And therefore, the Democrats are still the party of the Ku Klux Klan, right? right? And so everything is frozen in place uh, in the late 19th century. It's like, uh, I once said on Twitter, it's like Pat's Blue Ribbon, you know, <laughs> claims it, it won a contest in 1893. <laughs> if that's the best you can say, that we were good way back then, you really aren't really making the sale, right? Uh, and so that's what the GOP is trying to do. They're trying to still cling to that Blue Ribbon they got uh, yeah. under under Lincoln. 1865 is the best, the, the epitome yep. of what they accomplished. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think it's probably a great place to take a, a break because I do want to cut to a new topic and we come back. So we've got great sponsors always here on, on Democracy. Let's hear from them. And now it's time for a brief lesson on the history of toilet paper. You know, the first perforated toilet paper rolls were introduced in 1890, but it wasn't until 1930 that we officially had splinter-free tissue. Prior to that, people just used what was on hand. And oh my gosh, corn cobs, parchment, and even pages from the farmer's almanac. Nowadays, we're clear-cutting our farce just to make something we use just once and flushed on the toilet. And that's why I love real paper. Real makes a sustainable toilet paper that contains no trees and instead uses 100% bamboo. Now, Real's paper is certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, meaning they are responsibly harvesting the bamboo grass that's used for their paper. And while other conventional tree-based papers are wrapped in plastic in the grocery aisle, Real Paper's packaging is plastic-free, compostable, and offers free shipping on all orders. But here's the best part. When I use Real, it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. It truly has become my go-to TP. Now, Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. So, here it is. If you head to realpaper.com slash Fred and sign up for a subscription using my code Fred at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash Fred. Or write your promo code Fred to get 30% off your order free shipping. Let's stop flushing our forest. Try real papers. Tree free paper. Real is paper for the planet. If you're like me, you understand the pain of finding out what to wear each day. I mean, most clothes I have are uncomfortable, never actually the size I really am, and not to mention how much time is wasted trying to find a good outfit. And when you do have a good fit, you can only wear it for a few hours where you have to change for an important meeting or dinner, find a new outfit. Now, everyone wants to dress well at all times because simply put, it's a confidence booster, even for men like me. Men's closets were due for a radical overhaul and reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man, and here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with the commuter collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. You have never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection. With gold fusion, anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long, and on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can just ditch it all in the dry cleaner or ditch the dry cleaner completely. Put it all in your own washing machine yourself. You know, I'm obsessed with the Roan Commuter Collection. We're on the move a lot, whether it's I'm catching a flight or I'm going to a meeting or whatever. The Roan Commuter Collection has never let me down so far. The Commuter Collection get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to head to roan.com slash Fred. Use promo code Fred to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off. Your entire order when you head to r h o n e dot com slash Fred and use code Fred. It's time for you to find your corner office of comfort. Check out our sponsor, Roan. I hope you'll buy some outfits today. And we're back. So 
I want to move on. You wrote a great piece the other day, and it's why I've been begging you to come on, but you got sick. <laughs> you know, the, the the piece you did about Truman and the Do Nothing Congress. And it's something I've been saying quite a bit as I do. I gave a speech right here in, in, in St. Louis County to a Democratic uh, committee uh, meeting last night about the idea that we're not just – in many ways, it feels like Trump. We've, we're beyond Trump at this point, right? It, it's not just Trump. I live in Missouri. Uh, the flamethrower idiots. We have these all these. We have these Republicans running around with flamethrowers for right. reasons. Right. I, you know, we had a young woman burn. She checked out books from the Springfield Library and then burned them. Uh, it's just it, the insanity is beyond Trump at this point. And you you did a great job pointing out how Truman, in many ways, kind of went against conventional wisdom at the time and ran against not just Dewey but the Do Nothing Congress. Right. You know, and I think that's a great way to start. I mean, what was Truman? What did Truman do? Let's, for those who aren't familiar, what did Truman do and why? Well, so we got to remember, you know, Truman, uh, when he was running in 1948, was running as someone who wasn't supposed to be president. Right. Uh, he was an accidental president. Uh, he, he'd come into office when uh, um, FDR died in uh, 1945. He'd been a compromised candidate for VP, uh, the kind of the guy that uh, neither side really hated too much. So they <laughs> rallied around him. Yep. He had a high popularity after the war, but it really sank uh, uh, in the end of the you know the low 30s. Uh, they the Democrats get wiped out of a 1946 midterm, and um, Democrats are saying you know Truman should just resign. He should appoint a Republican Secretary of State uh, with uh, the the um, uh, cooperation of Congress, yeah. uh, and then resign him because there was no vice president. This Republican would become president, right? Um, and that's floated by members of his own party. Um, J. William Fulbright, a senator from Arkansas, proposes that. Um, Truman doesn't go for the idea, and afterwards he only <laughs> refers to Fulbright as half-bright. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, of just how pronounced the hatred was, yeah. right? And then going into 48, Truman's got a fractured Democratic Party, right? Right. The, when they embrace the civil rights plank in, at the convention, the Dixiecrats bolt to the right, progressives bolt to the left behind Henry Wallace. Uh, and so the party's in shambles. And as everyone assumes, Truman's going to get destroyed, yeah. right? He's running against Tom Dewey, who had done the best of any Republican had ever done against FDR in 1944. It seems he's just going to coast to victory. Polling units are are stopping the polls in October, they assume. Wow. Uh, Dewey's going to win in a walk. His uh, members of his cabinet who are being floated are buying homes in D.C. That's how convinced they are. <laughs> we're going to win, right? Everyone assumes this is going to win. What does Truman do? He doesn't run against Dewey. No. He runs against Congress, right? And he runs against what he calls the do-nothing Congress. He summons them back. He challenges them to pass these things in the fair deal. But they said, oh, yeah, we're for that, too. We'll get to that later on. Uh, and they don't pass anything. So he calls them the do-nothing Congress, mm. and he runs against the Democratic Party as a whole. Well, what I note in that piece is, yeah, they didn't pass Truman's fair deal proposals, you know, Social Security, civil rights, things like that. But that Congress actually did a lot. Yeah. That's the Congress that puts through the Marshall Plan. Yeah. And the Truman Doctrine. Um, that's the par That's the uh, uh, the Congress that, uh, even if we ignore foreign policy stuff, on domestic issues, they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which is a huge anti-labor law. Yeah. It starts right to work programs in states. And it's a huge move for them. It's a huge success. They passed the 22nd Amendment, which limits a president to two terms. It's a huge swipe at FDR, right? Yeah. So they do a lot on their own terms, but Truman characterizes them as the do-nothing Congress. He runs against them, makes them the punching bag. Wow. Well, if you compare today's Congress to the <laughs> do-nothing Congress, oh, my God, that Congress way back then, the 80th Congress, was badly maligned. They did <laughs> right. a whole lot. This right. is a Congress that has literally done nothing. I, I had a, a chart in that a Substack post of mine uh, that showed what a Congress had done year by year, and it just craters for this one. Yeah, They have done so little. And, and think about it. This is a Congress, uh, the GOP House we're talking about, really, Yeah, took 15 tries to pick a speaker. Yep. And then they deposed him. They got rid of him. Yep. Right? And a coup. Yep. They bounced around a couple other candidates. Ended up with Mike Johnson, this guy who who is you know had failure after failure. Yep. What are their successes? The Jim Comer investigations into Hunter Biden. <laughs> At this point, I'm convinced Jim Comer is actually a, a Democratic mole, <laughs> trying to make the Republicans look as bad as possible. Their key witness turned out to be a Russian spy. Right. Yeah. So it's insane. They've impeached uh, uh, the 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 Secretary of Homeland Security. Yep. And what is a, the, what the first impeachment of a cabinet secretary in like 150 years. Yep. It is 
not for anything he's done criminally wrong. Oh. He's not like holding gold bars like Bob Menendez at home or something, right? <laughs> it's that he's implemented the Biden administration's right. uh, border policy. Well, that's just politics, right? Yeah. So they've done nothing, uh, less than nothing. It's blown up in their face, right? And so I think if Biden were to take a page from Truman here and run against that Congress, I think it would be, A, a, a political winner for him, because then it's not... Biden versus Trump, the rematch, these two old guys going head to head. Yep. It's Biden presenting an image of what the Democrats offer and what they've done on policy. And they've got some accomplishments to really point to, right? Yep. In terms of Biden's accomplishments, one of the most successful Democratic presidents or any president since LBJ. Yep. Right. Has gotten a lot done. Yep. Point to that stuff. Point to what the Democratic Party has done. Point to what the Republican Party has not done. Yep. Right. And thereby make it about more than just one man, make it about the entire party. And therefore, people who th might think, ah, eh, Biden, I'm not really inspired by him. I don't like him on this or that. He's kind of boring, whatever. You know, I don't like ice cream, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, that's not what it's about. It's about, uh, did we get student loan relief? Did we get infrastructure? Did we get climate change uh, abatement? Those kind of things really come to the forefront. Make it about the substance, right? right. And, and that's a winning message, I think, for Democrats. Uh, and they've just got to lean into it. Yeah, I agree. And, and and there's a cliff. I mean, you can do it. You know, I'm, I'm a visual thinker. I'm, I did commercials. You know, it's like you can see the cliff of all the accomplishments. And then here comes the Republican Congress. I mean, it's it truly is do nothing. And it, and, it, and the Congress is his opponent in, in, in every way, shape or form. And they're proving that today. And I took heart if you saw any reports from uh, New York three, um, you know, at, 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 yeah. when Tom Swazi, what I found fascinating about that, and I mentioned the show a couple of weeks ago was um, how many people, the voters were telling reporters, hey, look, I'm voting for I'm a Democrat or a Republican. I voted for Trump, but I'm voting for the Democrat because this Congress is failing. You know, they they had a chance. They wanted an immigration bill. They got an immigration bill, the toughest one in 25 years, and they turned it away because Trump said yeah. so. You can re there, there's real meat to that. It's not just like 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 we laugh. I mean, Truman kind of made that shit up. <laughs> you know, they you know, they really they were that's why I laughed about your piece is like they actually did stuff. Like right? these yeah. guys are no shit, do nothing, no nothing. That second part mm -hmm. they didn't use much. Yeah. There are yeah. no nothing Congress too, right? You know, I mean, Margie Taylor Greene's the intellectual you know, queen. I mean, my God, Jim Jordan, faceplant Jim. It, it, it's just he could truly yeah. take that on. And you're right. I do love the angle that you mentioned of it's not just Biden, Trump, the rematch. It's Biden, the Republican Party. Yeah, because it's yeah. all of them now. It's all of them now. And this mm -hmm. part, like you mentioned earlier, the, this party is historically toxic in ways yeah. that I find shocking. It goes right through the, the, the kowtowing to Russia. You know, I mean, the, the idea that we're holding up aid. I don't know if you saw it on the way. We, we're recording on Wednesday, folks. I just tell people that because they don't know. But on the way here, what was it? A letter from 23 leaders of Western democracies to the United States Congress, Speaker of the House, urging him to pass aid to Ukraine. Yep. That feels unprecedented, but you're a historian. You may know better than me. <laughs> I, uh, I don't recall leaders of a country urging, not the president, but the, the president, speaker of the yeah. house. They, and they've identified this. I, I, I haven't seen that letter, but I did see the comments from, um, uh, I guess it was the Polish foreign minister who said, look, if Russia takes over Ukraine, this is on Mike Johnson's uh, 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 lap. This is his fault, right? And so they are clearly identifying in a way that, even American media. I was going to say, they have right? a better view than we do. The, the, the American media always oh, talks about Congress has not done this. Congress has failed to do that. The, the government has not done this. They've zeroed in on who the bad actors are, and I think they're exactly right. So, yeah, I think the uh, uh, American uh, uh, press and Democrats need to do the same. Well, that's it. And, 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 there, and there is... It's a fight, one, that needs to be fought. I, as an old soldier, I would say, what's the fight that needs to be? There's the fight you can win, the fight that needs to be fought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes those aren't the same, right? right. <laughs> That's why I tell Missouri Democrats all the time. I, I told these Democrats last night, they're like, well, what about us? You know, we're screwed. It's like, well, think of it like World War II. Um, we were winning from about day six. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, people think I'm crazy when I say that, but I don't know, look at the history. We, we, we turned things around pretty well. You know, we had, we had Pearl Harbor, we had Kasserine Pass, but things kind of went our direction after that. Mm -hmm. But it's still took three years, three and a half, yeah. four years, right? We, we, it, and the people who lived in the, 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 the east of France probably didn't feel like we were catching up anytime soon, right. <laughs> you know? Right. So there are, there are places that have to hold and fight as best you mm -hmm. can, like Missouri, you know, like Georgia, like Texas. I, got, I, had, I talked to Colin Allred yesterday. Um, and so historically, it's, it's why I love talking to historians about this. Like the, the, we're in that same situation. I mean, do you see it that sort of a way as well in your, in your yeah. experience? Yeah, I do. And, and the really, uh, I think the the remarkable move we've seen uh, this week too, 
it's not just that uh, I think Democrats are, are going to take an eye on Congress. They're going to finally look at the state legislatures. Yes. Right. Yes. They're finally going to make a campaign there. And they've ignored this for so long. And, and the right has been great at this. Yep. Uh, the, the, the real success of 2010 that we've been living uh, in the wake of ever since was their huge takeover of states across the country. And now I think Democrats are finally realizing uh, they not only should fight there, but they can fight and they can call out the IVF bans, the bans on uh, on contraception. There are a lot of kind of very crazy right wing ideas that are floating up at, at, from state legislators and state officials. They can really target. And that lets people in Missouri and Oklahoma and Texas and other places like that Get involved, right? You know, yep. you may not be able to win the whole state, but you can win back part of that uh, legislative chamber. And that's a really important fight. Yeah, and that's our battle here. I just left a meeting with a state Senate candidate. Um, you know, in Missouri, they have, and many states in the South, are, and the, they have uh, super majorities, which means mm -hmm. essentially they can run the state uh, by themselves, not the Democrats, essentially. The Democrats could not even show up for work, and they have a quorum. Um, and so we're working very hard. Uh, our, our minority leader, Crystal Quay, is also running for governor. Um, the Democrats, thank God, our Senate Democrats here in Missouri. But one thing I do point out a lot, and, and we'll probably wrap the last con conversation, is I tell people a lot, in many ways, the Republicans hate each other more than they hate us. <laughs> I mean, I believe in my heart, you know, let's look at the Freedom Caucus, you know, versus Normie's fight. Um, I, you know, and in my lifetime, I haven't seen that kind of a dis, especially the Republican no. Party. Because remember, that was the Ronald Reagan was, you know, never speak ill of a Republican. The 11th commandment. Yes. Yeah. So how far back do we have to go in your in your experience to compare where a party like the Republican Party specifically let's say is so, bl I mean, they hate each other. Let's be honest. You know, Marty yeah. Sutter hates, you know, there's, there's, and same way all the way down. The, open, the Michigan yeah. GOP is an open uh, war. They're, right. I think they're having rival conventions, right? Yeah. I mean, and so we see this all over, uh, and it really does show that they're, you know, we often say Democrats in disarray is a cliche. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. really in disarray. And you got to go back to really the 60s Wow, when there was a kind of a, a the old Eisenhower, moderate Republicans had the party wrested away from them by the Goldwater uh, conservatives, right? Yeah. And they, the moderates thought they were crazy and they thought they were doomed, and they were in 64. It was a total defeat. Uh, but they slowly clawed their way into control of the party, right? And so now we're seeing a, a similar surge. Um, those Goldwater Republicans became the moderates, and now an even farther right fringe is trying to take control of the party. And we'll see uh, whether or not they succeed. Uh, and a lot of this is going to uh, play out not just in the presidential election, but again, state and local ones. So wherever you are, wherever you're listening, uh, get involved, because I guarantee there's a fight uh, within walking distance of you that you can take part in. Yeah, and there's real danger. This this project, you, know, you talk about the Goldwater Republicans, it made me think of Heritage Foundation and this bizarre Project 2025 thing they're doing, which is, you know, historically they did, you know, a, a policy for, plan, yeah. but this goes beyond that. I mean, it's it's. Have you had a chance to look at that a lot? I mean, I I've, I just posted a series of videos on our channel about yeah. just how deeply insidious and deeply malignant this could be. Yeah, and it shows how far off the rails Heritage has gone. You know, back in the yeah. Reagan years, they used to get, you know, they would put you give a one page primer on immigration reform or a tax bill, or whatever. And it was all fairly kind of center right stuff. Um, nothing too crazy. They have gone all in yeah. uh, with this uh, really wild campaign. Uh, and again, it goes back to what we talked about before. It's about retribution, right? This isn't a, uh, they're not putting forth a political agenda to improve the lives of their fellow Americans. They're putting forth a political agenda that is one of petty payback and, and vindictive politics, right? And that's just something that I think, uh, again, is not going to resonate with a lot of Americans, right? Uh, but they've made it clear, but that's what they want. Yeah. And that's where I get hope. And that's probably a great place to start because I always try to get our show to a hopeful place. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I never try to have a show that's like, oh, by the way, it's the end of the world. Anyways, have a great week. <laughs> you know, but I do find I do find hope in their hatred for each other. I know it sounds funny. And this is what we, Missouri is not a complete hellscape. Let's be very honest politically because the that we have wonderful politicians, my friend Doug Beck and Crystal Quaid, who are up there in Jefferson City, we're able to play these assholes against each other. And you're seeing that. It'll be interesting to see if that that dynamic finally develops in our Congress as I think this Ukraine aid bill this week could be one of those places, right, where finally people of common sense say, look, I'm, I'm done with this yeah. stupid shit, you know, yeah. and 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 then we play that as, and you're right, we are united. And I go back and then we'll, you know, the, the historic transition of Pelosi to Hakeem Jeffries, seeing seeing a, a, a peaceful transfer of power between the old guard to a new guard mm -hmm. really says a lot about where the Democratic Party is today, I think, don't you? I mean, you, we certainly didn't expect that, I don't think. Did you? No, not at all. I mean, it really, it's been overdue. I mean, Pelosi was 
uh, I think a ma- one of the best speakers, certainly I think in the last 30, 40 years in terms of holding together a diverse yeah. caucus. But, you know, she and her leadership team were getting up there in age. And so I think it's yeah. great to see that the Democrats have finally uh, turned things over to a younger generation, which is pr- pretty effective so far. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you found time for us. I'm glad you're feeling better. <laughs> Doc, you. And I know you're you're off a little bit right now, writing your latest book. When should we expect your newest book, my friend? Uh, years. Uh, it'll be uh, <laughs> out probably 2026. Okay. Uh, All right. Being honest. Okay. Yeah, yeah. These things are slow. But yeah. I'm on uh, social media. I'm on Substack. Uh, I'm Kevin M. Cruz. Substack.com for campaign trails. Great. Uh, with updates on both this work and politics today. Yeah. And 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 Kevin's a must read for those who aren't. I can't believe you. If you aren't, you're a fool. <laughs> so uh, your time is so valuable. I appreciate it. And thanks for joining us, man. And, and good luck on the book. Always great chatting with you. Take care, man. Cheers. Man, I love talking to Kevin Cruz. And if you've got time, go to the On Democracy podcast channel on YouTube. That's On Democracy podcast on our YouTube channel. Subscribe while you're there. If you don't subscribe already, we don't have as big a fog as our Myas Mighty, but we have quite a few. And you can go back and see all of our videos from before we joined the Myas Touch Network. Gosh, Matt, we've been doing this, what, almost a year and a half, right? Doing a while. So there's some really good interviews on there. Some really amazing people. Bill Crystal's in there and Katie Fang and... Kevin Cruz is in there with myth. So we've got some actually pretty good old videos. You still timely. So it's on democracy podcast on YouTube and, and watch Kevin's interview from, from a year ago too. Cause it's just as fascinating. Uh, in the meantime, you can always find me here uh, at F at FP Wellman, still on X and Twitter, FP Wellman official on threads and Instagram. I'd love you to follow us there. I'd love you to subscribe to all of our main channels. And of course, our Substack, which is now a Substack bestseller this week. I'm so excited. We, we got our bestseller badge because so many of you have signed up. That's uh, fpwellman.substack.com. We'd love to have you join us there. In the meantime, Midas Mighty, please leave a comment. Subscribe. Subscribe to our channels. Say hi. I do my best to say hi to you. Sometimes we get a couple, 3,000 comments, but I do my best to say hello. It means the world to us to get your feedback and, and talk about our guests. Be a part of this conversation because that's what this is all about. And remember what we just talked about. We're up against some really dark, scary stuff. We really truly are. But the organ what you do is you you organize. You work together. We can out-organize them. There's a reason that Moms for Liberty is fracturing right now because we organized at the grassroots level and beat them at their own game. And we can do it again and we will win because we are winning. We are winning. And maybe it doesn't feel like it in your theater of the war, but I'm telling you right now, we're winning. It's just a matter of keeping up the fight till the battle's won. So thanks for joining me and we'll see you next week.